Welcome back to Dornsife Dialogues and happy 2023. It's January, the month of New Year's resolutions. Surveys show that roughly 50% of these resolutions involve living a healthier lifestyle and eating healthier food. But what does that really mean? We are living in a golden age of food choice and shifting dietary guidelines. We hear that we're supposed to eat whole grains or maybe don't eat any grains at all. We're told to eat less fat or maybe eat only fat. It can all be very confusing. So how are we supposed to process all of this often conflicting information to make sense of what healthy eating really is for our bodies? That's the goal of today's panel. Our experts will help us understand what to eat and when for optimal health. And they have some interesting insight on how food is not only fuel, but also a tool that supports the functioning of every cell in the body, helping us stave off disease and increase our longevity. Our discussion will be moderated by alumna Laura Sanders. Laura reports on neuroscience for Science News, where she covers everything from healthy brain aging to artificial intelligence breakthroughs in medicine. Laura earned her PhD in molecular biology from USC Dornsife and her undergraduate degrees in creative writing and biology from Vanderbilt. I'll now turn it over to Laura, who will introduce our panelists. Thanks again to all of you for joining us and enjoy the program. Hi, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, it's well into the new year of 2023, and around this time, many of us, myself definitely included, started paying more attention to what we eat, when we eat it, all sorts of eating habits. Um, with that in mind today, we're going to talk about the science of healthier eating. Um, we're joined today by Walter Longo, Professor of Gerontology and Biological Sciences, the Edmund M. Jones Chair in Gerontology, USC Leonard Davis School of Gerontology, and best-selling author of The Longevity Diet. We're also joined today by Marianne Pence, Pop Professor of Population and Public Health Sciences, Sydney R. Garfield Chair in Health Sciences, and Director of the Institute for Prevention Research at Keck School of Medicine at USC. Um, so I'm delighted to have you both here. I'm hoping you can help us today kind of sort fads from fiction, um, from scientific facts, and walk us through the research on what we eat, when we eat it, um, and how food kind of fits into the rest of our lives. So thanks for coming. Um, I'm really looking forward the, to the discussion. And for our watchers, please post your questions in the webinar chat. And so Marianne, if we could start with you, um, I'd like to kind of start with the basics. You know, what kinds of things can we influence with the foods we eat? Um, one of the obvious changes, the one that gets a lot of attention, is our weight and our appearance. But beyond that, what are the other health effects of nutrition? Thank you, by the way, for having me here. And thank you for everyone in the audience. Um, there are several things that we're typically not aware of that research shows. One is if we eat right, we decrease uh, inflammatory processes going on in our body. If that goes on long enough chronically, uh, it can lead sometimes to Crohn's disease, auto, autoimmune disorders, heart disease, some types of cancer, and diabetes too. So if we eat right and start that early and continue it, we're cutting out inflammatory processes. It's also improving our mental health. It doesn't sound like that makes sense, but it does, as well as our physical health. And there's enough research to support that we get a better sense of well-being overall if we're eating right. And that's true for adults, adolescents, children, you name it. Yeah, and Dr. Longo, Walter, if we could get your perspective too, you know, beyond kind of the obvious changes that we all think about, what are some of the, the things that a healthy diet or healthy eating habits can do? Yes, it's actually you know more complicated than people appreciate. Uh, so, for example, um, you know I come from Italy, and we hear a lot about the Mediterranean diet. Uh, but uh, in fact, the Mediterranean diet uh, um, can be very variable, right? Some people may eat uh, ten fruits a day, and that's not so good, right? So we always hear fruits and vegetables, right? So maybe it's not such a good idea anymore to have words like Mediterranean diet. Uh, we need to be more specific about what is it, what what's good or not for the specific person, right? So if somebody is uh, ten pounds overweight, uh, you certainly don't want to talk about fruits and vegetables, and maybe that that person eat uh, four bananas a day, thinking 
hey, this is great for me, right? So the, the doctor told me to eat fruits and vegetables. I'm eating the Mediterranean diet. And then also what we noticed uh, in one of my books in, in Italy uh, that we were asking people, uh, are you doing the Mediterranean diet? And everybody said, yes, 60% of people said yes. And then when we we realized that less than 10%, probably about 5% were actually doing what's considered a healthy or a very healthy Mediterranean diet, right? So, so I think it, it needs personalization, probably needs a nutritionist, a dietitian to, to guide people. But in general, uh, a, a mostly vegan, uh, maybe pescatarian, vegetarian diet, uh, pesco-vegetarian, those seem to be the ones that are uh, associated with the longest uh, uh, longevity, with, with longevity, and also with the re reduction of, of a variety of diseases. Uh, so high legumes, uh, high whole grain, high um, uh, nuts, uh, olive oil, et cetera, et cetera, low levels of red meat, uh, those seem to be pretty clearly associated also by what's called meta-analysis, right? So if you look at studies of all studies, they keep coming up. Um, and uh, so those are probably uh, good, uh, uh, you know, indications. Now, as the, as the dean uh, mentioned, it's all personalized, right? So somebody could uh, could benefit greatly from whole grain. Somebody else could be intolerant or develop inflammation, as we just heard, uh, from whole grains, right? Or the same thing from, uh, uh, you know, gluten, bread, and pasta. It's perfectly fine at, the, at a certain level, but at a high level now, the gluten can cause sensitivity, intolerance, autoimmunities even. And, uh, uh, and so I think it's a matter of, um, you know, the devil is in the details. And so it's a matter of having a professional. The professional doesn't, doesn't mean that you have to, you know, see somebody uh, once a week, but, uh, you know, maybe once or twice a year to just guide you through it, personalize it, and really rely on, on, on multi-pillar science, right? Epidemiology, clinical trials, basic research, uh, centenarians, right? What, what were the centenarians in Loma Linda, in, in Sardinia, in Okinawa? What were they eating? Uh, so all of that has to go into the decision of uh, what you eat. Yeah. yeah, so that that kind of renders my next question impossible to answer. But of the kind of seemingly endless variety, um, what kinds, if you could kind of go over the key factors of, of you know, the healthiest diet, the best diet, um, if you could distill it for us, you know, even among all that variation in in person to person. Is that a question for me or? or <laughs> yeah, yeah, for you, Walter. Yeah, so I think that this this new study uh, published in Plus Medicine, a couple million people were considered China, Europe, and the United States. And and when they looked at foods associated with the longest lifespan, uh, number one was legumes, number two number two was whole grains, uh, and then it was uh, nuts, um, and, uh, and and the negatives were red meat uh, was to be excluded or nearly excluded. And uh, um, and certainly processed foods, right? So those are those are the main uh, guidelines. Then I would say, um, you know, the vegans seem to also have some problems, right? It doesn't mean that you have to uh, have problems. You, you cannot be vegan and, and not have problems. But they, for example, fractures. There was reports on on increased fractures levels of fractures in those that are vegan. And so this is why we're saying maybe two or three times a week at least uh, of uh, fish, uh, low mercury fish, that could be uh, a, a good addition to the to the vegan to a, or a vegetarian diet, which makes it difficult, for example, to have enough of certain amino acids, which are key for, for uh, maintenance of, of good health. So those are the main uh, indications. And then I think, you know, uh, fasting for 12 hours a day, uh, that's another important one. Um, and uh, and then we'll talk later, I guess, about the, the different type of fasting. But it's certainly the on the everyday side, uh, twelve hours of fasting and twelve hours of feeding seems to be uh, a a method ar difficult to argue with. Yeah, that's really helpful. Kind of those those big picture points of eat this, not that. Um, and we will certainly get into fasting in more detail because I have a lot of questions about it, and I bet our viewers do too. Um, but I wanted to turn to Marianne because you study nutrition at the other end of the spectrum. You know, there's the longevity aspect, but children and adolescents nutrition. Um, if you can kind of walk us through some of those key considerations when it comes to kids, 
um, and, you know, getting a good start in their nutrition habit? Um, first of all, I wanted to say whether it's adults or children or adolescents, you know, we've all heard this term, we are what we eat. What I'd like to say is we eat, but we eat in context. It has a lot to do with the environment around us, what's available for us to eat, what access, how much time we have to eat, whether or not we sleep right. So I'm, I'm going to address some of this. So with children and adolescents, about mid-childhood through adolescence, um, those age groups are slowing down in their physical activity. And one of the things I wanted to bring up and remind us about is that energy balance, which I can get to later, which typically looks at calories in, calories out. But energy balance is also taking a look at the really important role that physical activity and sedentary behavior have in terms of eating right and keeping normal weight. So for adolescents, physical activity is decreasing anyway. I mean, if anybody's had an eighth grader or remember themselves as an eighth grader, you're basically a slug. You follow around your, your friends. It's not cool anymore to exercise unless you're on a sports team. And with more and more hours spent on social media, computer for homework, watching television, on top of low physical activity is sedentary behavior. So both of those really put children mid-childhood and adolescents at an increased risk for obesity. Uh, there are several studies out showing that at the time that people are, uh, young people are uh, having sedentary behavior, whether it's in front of a computer or TV, very often when they grab for food, it's impulsive eating and more often than not, it's sugar-based which is very bad for you, uh, contributing to inflammatory processes. So one of the things we could take a look at and have looked at, um, and I'll bring a larger issue in in a moment, is to have regular eating times a day. Now, it's a little bit easier as long as your child is under your roof. It's not as easy once someone becomes an adolescent or young adult. They're outside of the house a lot. They're with friends. But to the extent that families can participate in dinner together, uh, it takes time to do, but it's shown that it slows down the eating process and has a lot of multiple benefits to both the youth as well as the parents. The other thing is for parents to offer healthy snacks. And, you know, that's questionable. A parent can pull something off of a shelf. And when I talked about environment before, sometimes a parent will go in a store and the concept is called lost leader in a grocery store. So they see a big, big container of Coke or a big bag of potato chips or hot Doritos and they're 99 cents. Okay, what is a parent going to grab for if it's less expensive and doesn't take any time to prepare? They might do that. Alternatives would be choosing big bags of fresh food, fruits and vegetables. So a good example is taking fruits and vegetables that have high water content. So that cuts down on the need for a child or adolescent to be thirsty all the time. A good example would be reaching for an orange. Citrus has relatively low sugar compared to some other fruits. It's easy to peel. If a mom or dad does their job just right, they'll, they'll include a napkin <laughs> for their child so it's not messy to open up. Um, but uh, having fruits and vegetables handy that either satisfy what might otherwise be sugar or water need or a crunchy taste would be good. Um, these are fresh fruits and vegetables. The other thing is that I've seen, and I've seen it with my own granddaughter who's 16, is I see a lot of teenagers drinking uh, what is called natural water, but it's carbonated. And it's typically flavored. And I won't name names here, but they're thought to be healthy by adolescents and very often by their parents, and they're not. Any carbonated beverage uh, is slightly acidic. And if, if it's used a lot or, or the main way to take water or liquid into your system, over time, it's going to leach the calcium out of your teeth. So parents need to be aware of that. They can uh, substitute with flat water 
spring water, things like that, not carbonated beverages. And one of the other things to watch out for is beverages or foods and snacks that say that they're naturally flavored with watermelon or whatever. If you look carefully at that, the actual flavorings from true fruit fruit uh, juices is very small and the taste comes from chemicals that are used to produce that flavor. And we've also seen the same type of thing operated in the tobacco arena with a huge explosion of e-cigarettes and vaping products in young people. And they prefer fruit flavored vaping products. They're all, they're all full of chemicals. So I wanted to discuss that um, before. The other, the other thing I wanted to say, and maybe might not be as well known, is that um, executive function, which is the normal development in your brain that everybody needs to go forward in life and be developmentally healthy on a lot of levels, uh, is, is made up of a bunch of higher level cognitive skills. Two of these are behavioral impulse control. Okay, that's directly related to lack of control eating if you don't have that executive function skill or you're low on it. Another one is emotional regulation, which has to do with the appeal of certain foods. Usually there might be more appeal towards French fries versus something that's fresh, uh, fresh fruit or vegetables. We can talk about that a little bit later, but I know you have other questions to go to. Yeah. yeah. And I also, I, I also wanted to comment uh, on the children. So I actually, we actually wrote a book on, on children nutrition with lots of pediatricians, uh, mostly in Italy, but also looked all over the world. And two things surprised us, you know, which was one was the um, we thought about and maybe in Amer in the United States is much more of a problem, like the candy and the, the sugary drinks and all that. But we were surprised to see that, in fact, when we look at the data, the typical Italian child was eating uh, one pound a day of high starch food, right? So they were eating potatoes, pasta, uh, bread, uh, uh, you know, pizza. Uh, and, and I'm assuming we, we, we're going to do that eventually in the United States, but I'm assuming it's fairly similar here. Uh, so a lot of uh, starches that very quickly become sugar, right? So if you eat rice, for example that turns into sugar almost as quickly as, as eating sugar straight out of the uh, a spoon of sugar. So, uh, and the other thing that surprised us was the proteins, right? So the Italian children, and the Italian children certainly eat less proteins than American children, but Italian children were eating three to four times more proteins than recommended by pediatricians, right? And most pediatricians that we talked to had no idea. Uh, so that was very interesting, right? So it's, it looked like they were eating proteins in the morning. They were then going to school and they were giving proteins at school. And then they're coming home and they were getting proteins at home, right? So, of course, then there is a spectrum. There is a spectrum and, and there's the other side and people, some people don't have food, you know? And so I'm not saying that everybody's in that situation. So clearly in the pandemic, we saw that, hey, there's some people that have to go to school to have proteins, right? So, but but... I think that we have both problems, right? It's poverty on one side, and on the other side, three to four times more proteins than every pediatric and medical association in the world will agree it's a, it's a correct level for, for a child. So, That's yeah. A huge, so, huge increase, four times as much. So yeah. tell us more about why that's a problem. You know, I think the very um, naive perspective on this is, oh, it's breakfast time. You need some proteins. Fill your body with these proteins so you don't crash at 10 a.m. You know, my kids are always I'm shoving peanut butter in their mouth sometimes. And tell me why I shouldn't do that. Well, but that's exactly the problem, right? So yeah. that everybody thinks protein is so, and the surveys in the United States shows exactly that. People think protein is the, is the healthiest, uh, uh, you know, macronutrient that, that there is, right? So that's not the case. So why is it? Well, it controls growth factors, right? So it pushes IGF-1, growth hormone, et cetera, et cetera, to, uh, to a higher level. Also, uh, our data indicates that it may contribute to insulin resistance, right? So the high IGF-1, in the presence of high IGF-1, the excess carbohydrates are now turning into insulin resistance and more fat accumulation, right? So 
So yes, on one side, you're pushing too many growth factors and these growth factors uh, seem to give the signal to accumulate fat. Uh, and now, you know, if a child uh, is overweight or obese, uh, uh, continuously from seven to 18, uh, one study suggested a 400% increase in the risk of diabetes as an adult. So, so uh, yeah, so then this is not just a problem when, when the child is a child, but, uh, but it may be something that behavior wise, but also maybe epigenetically, and there may be other factors that, so, so some, you know, DNA modification, let's say for the lay audience, that may last a long, long time and may make it very difficult for the child eventually to uh, to lose weight. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it makes sense, you know, there might be these kind of biological echoes later in life that you pattern early on as a kid. And Marianne, some of the things you mentioned seem like great candidates for just eating habits, you know, learning how to eat healthy foods and not reaching for sodas or snacks that might not be good for us. Um, I did want to shift. So there's this question about when is too late in life to start changing your habits for benefits. Um, Walter, I know you mentioned a study that recently looked at kind of the benefits you get at various ages. And so I wonder if you could talk us through what's known about that. You know, how how much can we expect to improve and how how long do we have to do it for? Yes. So, so what I mentioned earlier, the, the, the legumes, the whole grains, the nuts, et cetera, et cetera, and, and the low meat, the processed food, et cetera. They, this, uh, this study in Norway, looking at the, 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 the three continents, uh, showed a, a, a 11 to 13 years life expectancy increase. It started at age 20 from the West compared to the Western diet, let's say, right? So if there was a switch from the Western diet, <clears throat> to this type of diet, which I call the longevity diet, um, a 20 that was associated with 11 to 13 years of, of life expectancy increase. <clears throat> if it was started at 60, it was still eight to nine years of life expectancy increase. And even if it was started at 80, uh, it was three to four years of life expectancy. So so this is, uh, I think, remarkable. And it's consistent, I think, in general with the Harvard uh, uh, studies, uh, physician nurse study and, and many other studies. So I think it's we're starting to see uh, somewhat of a you know consistent uh, um, you know backing for this type of nutrition and uh, and longevity, but also health. Yeah, yeah. So there's no um, no delaying, no point of no return. You might as well just get started if you're thinking about it. Um, yeah. And also, <clears throat> something that we introduced a number of years ago is phase-specific uh, nutrition, right? So, for example, now we're recommending um, uh, the Mediterranean diet is not essentially a very good diet for for the children, right? So up to age twenty, but not so good anymore for twenty to seventy, and then it becomes good again. I think seventy and, and on, right? Well, well, why? Well, probably again too much proteins and and too many ingredients that are are not. Uh, contributing to to health and 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 uh, delaying aging uh in the mediterranean diet uh but uh, so in the longevity diet for example lower protein uh in that 20 to 70 period but then when when we um when we look at the 80 year olds uh, reporting low proteins they were not doing so well at all right and uh, um and so this also reminded us uh, reminded us of our studies of italian centenarians where you know, around 70 or 80, they often move in with their children, with their sons and daughters, and they start eating more proteins, more milk, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, so th there seems to be a consistent pattern where if you have a poor diet in this 20 to 70, uh, so if you have a good diet when you're a child, then a poor diet 20 to 70 period, and then you go back to a more a richer diet, more nourishing diet after 70 that seems to be, uh, you know, looking at all the different pillars, that seems to be a very good strategy. Yeah, yeah. And that gets at that point you made earlier about individual needs changing. You know, there's no one size fits all across everyone at every age. Um, I wondered if I could get both of your thoughts on certain kinds of diets that we've all heard about, like Atkins, low carb, paleo. Are there certain drawbacks to some of those that we might not be as aware of you know are there concerns um what does the science say 
Marian, you want to start and then I'll, I'll continue? Um, since I work on behavioral interventions, I'm going to defer to you, Walter. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so I think that this is really a, a big problem, like worldwide, right? Because uh, um, and just like the, we'll talk about the 16-hour fasting, et cetera, uh, later, but it's the same issue, right? So you, you get quick benefits, right? So if you go on a very low-carb diet, you're going to get a quick benefit. And most people will lose weight, right? And then most people will get tired of that and then regain it all back. And, put that, and often they regain it even more, right? But, but because of this benefit, that this quick benefit that you get, people, uh, a lot of people uh, start doing this type of low-carb diet, ketogenic diet, et cetera, et cetera. The data, first of all, I always say, I've never met a centenarian on a low-carb low diet. And I've gone through <laughs> Okinawa to South America, Central America, name it. Everywhere in the world, I've met centenarians. I've never met one that said, oh, I had a low-carb diet. And uh, But then if you go to Lancet meta-analysis and different meta-analysis, you'll see that low-carb diet and also the Harvard the physician and nurse studies, uh, the low-carb diet are associated with a shorter lifespan. Uh, so then, uh, you know, the long-term consequences, you could be already mid-term consequences on health, but certainly long-term, uh, the association is with a shorter lifespan. If you go on a low-carb, in particular, a very low-carbohydrate diet. And uh, um, the only exception I've seen is the, uh, the Harvard studies uh, indicating that if it's moderate carbohydrate, around 40% of calories coming from carbohydrate, but it's mostly plant-based, that seems to be really an ideal uh, diet, right? An, an ideal nutrition for longevity. Almost nobody has that, but mm -hmm. if, if the people that managed to have that, and it was probably a relatively small group uh, that they followed, uh, they seem to do extremely well, better than everybody else, right? So, but, uh, but the Lancet study meta-analysis showed that it's better to have an 80% carbohydrate diet than a, than a low-carb diet for longevity. Uh, so, but then what people do, people then confuse high carb with too much, too much carb, right? So we're talking about, um, the portion of, of what you eat. So, but let's say it's about 60% of your calories should come from carbohydrate. That doesn't mean the carbohydrates are good for you. If you you have excess carbohydrate, this is why people don't like it. A lot of times when I say you have to have a high carbohydrate diet, because they think that I'm saying you have to have too much carb, but of course, and that's not the case, right? So 72% of Americans now are overweight and or obese. And so, and that comes from too much calories from all sources, not just carbohydrate. And, and of course, you know, if you're in that category, you want to, you know, limit your carbohydrates so that you go back to, uh, to an ideal uh, fat uh, percentage and, uh, and weight and, and also lean body mass, uh, lean body mass, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you raised this idea that we touched on a little bit, Marianne, with kind of calories in, calories out, and this kind of energy expenditure relating to it. I wonder if you could, you know, flesh that idea out a little more for us. You know, what does that mean? And what are the implications for kids, adolescents, and, and adults, all of us? So if you, if you go through to about age 18, you can have a typical female who probably is uh, going to need up to about 2,400 calories a day and males a little bit more than that. We're talking about through the end of adolescence. And, you know, the, the, the more traditional understanding of energy balance is, well, you know, if I need that many calories in a day, uh, if I impulsively eat a Big Mac and French fries, I've added 1,100 calories. And that means I either have to give up somewhere else during the day to eat, which is just about impossible for most people, um, or think about something that alternatively has fewer calories. At the same time, thinking about at least small ways to increase physical activity. So, you know, if someone walks one mile, they're only burning 100 calories. That's a little disappointing for most people. <laughs> they think it's burning a lot more. And both adults and adolescents find uh, sort of the standards in the U.S. for moderate and, vi and vigorous physical activity to be sort of daunting. 
there are long periods of time. They think they have to sweat a lot, change their clothes, shower a lot, and nobody has the time to do it. Well, the more recent research is showing that if you break down physical activity into mini bouts of 10 minutes or even a little bit less, but a few times a day, you're getting the same benefits of exercise and not so much in, in uh, more caloric um, expenditure, but more in terms of the other benefits of a sense of well being, a sense of balance again, a sense of uh, restraint in feeling like you have to eat impulsively. That gets into that domain I talked about before with executive function training. So in the brain, we've got different skills that we, we can observe, basically. Uh, one is uh, inhibitory control, to be able to cut down on uh, your impulses to eat and grab whatever you have. Another one is emotional regulation. Oh, I want to eat a pizza because it's just great to get a, together with my friends. We're going to have a good time. I'm not going to pay attention to how much pizza I eat. Uh, that's more of an emotional appeal for that. And we have ways of encouraging um, the exercise of executive function skills, which have the benefits along with physical activity of decreasing um, impulsive eating and steering one in terms of more purposeful eating. And I wanted to bring up something Walter brought up before. You know, there are two things that maybe add to the complexities here. One is he was pointing out that it's not the amount of carbohydrates you eat, but in your total dietary intake, what's the sort of percentage of intake devoted to carbohydrates is one. But the other one is the, that we have developmental changes occurring throughout our life for various reasons. And Walter brought that up too. So if somebody tries to go on a diet or a certain plan that works for them at age 18 or 25 and expect if they, if they keep that diet that way their entire life, it may not have the same, it might not accrue the same types of benefits as it did in another age, the age that they started at. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating to me, this idea that, you know, young person Mediterranean diet might be beneficial and then it loses that and then it gains it back maybe for later, um, just kind of illustrates that idea so well. Um, so calories in, calories out, we've talked about energy expenditure, Walter, your work a lot of has focused a lot on fasting, um, no calories in for various periods of time. I think a lot of us are overwhelmed with the amount of information out there about the different regimens we can do, the different times, how long we do it, what technically is it. If you could help us sort through some of the various ideas and programs that people follow, their benefits, their drawbacks. Um, any, yeah, if you could kind of hold our hand in this complicated area, that'd be helpful. Yeah, so so we focused a lot on on not just what works, but what people can do, right? And and what people uh, can continue doing, and uh, and so um, I think that uh, we tried, for example, water only fasting here in USC Norris Cancer Center. That was one of our first uh, clinical trials. Uh, in, I think it was two thousand nine, two thousand ten. And then quickly realized that even cancer patients, even though we, we were all convinced that ourselves and David Quinn and Tanya Dorf, we were all convinced that the, the cancer patient would be motivated and, and water only fasting would not be an issue. And we realized that that was not the case at all. Uh, but the oncologists were worried about water only fasting and the patients were more worried than the oncologists. Huh. And uh, so, so it's difficult to do water only fasting. And uh, so this is why for the longer fasting period, we, we've been studying and we introduced the, what, was, what we call the fasting mimicking diet. And these are is lots of different calorie ranges for lots of different uh, purposes. But for healthy people, let's say relatively healthy people, it's uh, 800 to 1100 calories. Uh, and this was developed here at USC. And now it's in, in lots of countries and, and lots of people are, are, are using this. And um, yeah, so then we, we recommend the, I, I think the problem with fasting, every 50 years or so, fasting comes back around, right? And then the medical community goes against it and fasting disappears. Um, 
but fasting in fact is 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 been part of us since the very beginning since billions of years ago you know i started working at ucla many years ago on starving bacteria starving yeast right and then most of microorganisms in the world are actually starving all the time and then once in a while they get they get some food they grow and then go back to starving right so that's you know the of course for humans it's not been like that but fasting like for the emperor penguins of, of the South Pole, right? They, they go several months a year where they have no food. And then when they do get to the food, they overeat. They become overweight and obese uh, to uh, to survive the two months of, of uh, no food. Right? So it's probably the, our reality, let's say 10, 20,000 years ago, when we would uh, have relatively long periods or or multiple periods during the year where there was nothing around. And so so that's probably part of our, our, our normal uh you know, uh, environment, and, and we need to go back to it. So, the, how, so how do we do it? But yeah, the fasting making diet, maybe two to three times a year, um, it's it's a good way to go. If somebody uh, is is anorexic and in a particular category, I think you need to have the physician uh, talk to you and 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 determine whether you can do it or not, right? And uh, um, and then if there is a disease, certainly, then absolutely you need a specialist saying. You know, so we have lots of cl cancer clinical trial, diabetes clinical trial running. Some of them are finished. So, but still, I think it's for any disease, uh, this longer fasting, uh, either going to a specialized clinic. And for example, in California, there's a True North clinic that does that. And there's many uh, very good ones with medical doctors in them in, in Europe. Um, but otherwise, uh, I mean, a, a, a physician and then hopefully uh, the collaboration with somebody that, that knows about the, this longer fasting. And then the shorter fasting, you know, the, the most popular one is 16-8 that everybody's heard uh, about right now. Fasting, believe it or not, I think it's uh, at least in the United States is the number one uh, diet, I mean, intervention, lifestyle intervention for health, right? Uh, so, so uh, or diet, let's say, dietary intervention for health. So lots of people are doing it, and uh, and so lots of people are doing the 16-8. And it turns out that it's not so good for you long-term. Uh, why? Well, because most people that do 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of feeding per day, they tend to uh, you know eat uh, dinner and skip breakfast. And now there's many, many studies, including meta-analysis, showing if you skip breakfast, you're going to live shorter. You're going to have more cardiovascular disease, and et cetera, et cetera, right? So these are, are correlation, associations, but... But still, right, when you start seeing this over and over and over in many studies, you probably want to have breakfast, right? And, and you probably don't want to go 16 hours. You probably want to stick with 12 hours. I'll always say Sachin Panda, a, a Salk has done lots of work on this. And, you know, you will argue 13, 14 hours. I'm arguing about 12 hours to just keep it very safe. And, 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 and I say, I've never seen a negative study on 12 hours of fasting and 12 hours of feeding. And if somebody has it, please send it to me because I keep saying this. And, and so far, nobody has ever sent me a study saying, no, you should not fast for 12 hours because it's bad for you. Um, so yeah, 12 hours. Then, then you have things like alternate day fasting and you have five two. Alternate day fasting is just completely out of uh, touch with reality. I mean, who's going to eat for one day and not the other? And, uh, um, you know, as much as it could have benefits, eventually it'd be very difficult. And it may even, you know, who knows, it could be uh, introducing dangers. Uh, and the same thing, I think, for skip, let's say, fasting two days a week or, or whatever, it, too much, um, too, de too um, uh, problematic in the sense that we don't know the consequences, right? So so we, we uh, that's not have been done uh, recently and it's not been studied carefully and so it could be that after 10 years of skipping uh, you know all meals uh, um, uh, for two days a week uh, you're going to see problems there were a study recently came out that suggesting in fact in skipping meals were associated with problems now you can argue with the study but I think it just came out a week ago but uh, but certainly that's a possibility right that, that if you keep doing these extreme things uh, that that are not necessarily well studied that that you're gonna see uh, you're gonna have problems right so so I would say 12 hours a day of fasting 12 hours of feeding and then maybe two or three times a year uh, fasting mimicking diet uh, uh, and uh, uh, and for disclosure purposes I, I, I started a company uh, and so I donate everything to charity. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, I just want to make sure that people know that, uh, you know, consider that, 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 that I, I did start a company 
that uh, that has the fasting mimicking diet. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, it, it's not necessary. And talk to your physician to decide, or your or your dietitian to decide with it. That's something that you want to do. Yeah, that's a great summary. You know, kind of keeping it very simple to twelve and twelve. I think is a, a guideline a lot of us can think about. And it interests me because my coworker a while back wrote about a study um, that just measured when people eat in the day. And it was fascinating to see, and maybe not surprising, but we eat all the time, you know, around the clock, we are snacking and having meals. Um, and that gets kind of back to Marian, your idea about dinner, you know, dinner being so important and kind of having this reserved time for eating and, and putting some boundaries around when the kitchen's open. Yeah, one of, um, let me back up for a second, because I think what you just said raises a question, and I don't know that there's a definitive answer at this point. You know, research goes back and forth about different points of view. You know, there has been a time when uh, what was suggested that uh, people eat mini meals you know, every two to three hours or four hours instead of regular meals like we used to have years and years ago, three square meals a day. Maybe Walter wants to jump in on this. I'm more familiar with the research that suggests if you have too many constant snacking or meals, you're not giving your body time enough to really recover, basically. And so there may be an inflammatory process there that goes on when you've got too much, almost constant ingestion of food or beverages. I wanna raise that as a point. Maybe Walter can address that. Um, the other is, uh, I see a couple of questions in the chat, both of which have to do with my comment about carbonated beverages. Um, I can't comment on how much a week harms the calcium in your teeth, I think that's, still sort of open to formal research studies to take a look at. But uh, uh, there was another question raised about the same thing, but talking about an alkaline diet. So alkaline water typically does not have carbonation in it, CO2. It's a CO2 that might leach from, from the teeth. Um, I myself pick up a jug of alkaline water, a gallon of water every week from Whole Foods. They have their own dispensary, dispensary. So if you bring your own jug, you can get that. And uh, I don't know of definitive studies on that, but it is supposed to help um, cut down or help prevent in inflammation from that. Um, Walter, I want to make a comment. When you were talking early on about you were a little surprised about the cancer patients and trying to put them on this regular fasting diet, you know, what you have talked about in, in other diets is I wonder if people really need novelty over time, whether it's fasting or particular a Medita Mediterranean diet. And um, I'm not personally familiar with the research that takes a look in a very systematic way of varying the types of food choices you would have that each of which is supposed to address something that is healthy for you but we are human beings. So if we were expected to have the same diet with the same food day in and day out for a year or two, two years or whatever, it might be tougher for us than having sort of a limited variety that we can choose from that um, addresses the same kind of nutritional benefit, but they're different. Walter, did you want to say anything about here about that? Uh cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously, we we've been looking at sort of the, the reality on the, on the field, right? So, meaning that um, what are people willing to do, and and this is why also the development of the fasting mimicking diet that, that we recommend maybe three times a year, right? So, and with flexibility. So, we're basically saying uh, some people are going to be able to change in a personalized way to a longevity diet, right? So it's a high legume, high whole grains, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and and some people cannot, right? And and, and so those that cannot, uh, what are we going to say? We're going to give them drugs? Well, we uh, now have followed. We uh, there's two foundation clinics that uh, that I establish, and we follow thousands of people, and we see that you know almost everybody is willing to do one or the other, right? So 
So they're either willing to change their diet or change the diet a little bit. Uh, or modify, let's say, their diet, or they're saying, okay, I can't do that, but I'll I'll, I'll do three cycles of this five-day fasting mimicking diet a year. And this is actually what we're starting to test in Southern Italy with 500 patients. Uh, so, yeah, so I think that um, then there, there are approaches that fit the great majority of people, uh, and it's just a matter of finding out. And this is why the dietitian, uh, and we have, you know, I, I started the, the registered dietitian program here at USC. It's a very successful one uh, now and uh, uh, directed now by Kerry Kreutzer, who used to be in, in, in uh, preventive medicine. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we, we focus on, you know, healthy longevity, nutrition for healthy longevity. And I would say that yeah, the great majority of, of people can be at least helped uh, um, by, uh, by them. Uh, in a, in a longevity or healthy longevity sense, and then regarding the meal, the small meals, um, yeah, I think that um, you know, and this is also in agreement with the work of Sachin Panda that looked at how people eat and 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 in the United States and and uh, using an app and people taking pictures, and it turns out that people were eating about fifteen. And so, I mean, we never did a formal study on this, but but uh, you know the. If you if you say to somebody you can eat you should eat not you can you should eat five or six times a day now, and I imagine that person that gets to eight p.m. and and only has eaten three times right and <laughs> it's exactly what Sachin Panda saw they say hey my doctor told me to eat six times right so I got three more you know <laughs> and uh, sure enough he saw people eating at midnight one a.m. two a.m. right so so yeah and and eating for fifteen hours a day right so. Uh, the, the three meals, I think it's a much better strategy. It's an old strategy, but it seems to be working very well. Uh, and it seems to be feeding all the pillars, right? So that, that you get nourishment out of it, uh, but also it prevents you from excess, you know, intake. And most people don't realize that all you need to do is have an extra 50 calories a day, kilocalories a day. And eventually you're going to be obese, right? So it's not that you need to have 500 extra calories a day. It's 50 calories. So if you have an extra small snack, very small, like even an apple, right? If you have an extra apple a day, eventually if it's more calories than you need that you consume, that's going to make you obese. It's going to take 10 years, but uh, it's going to make you obese, right? So, so yeah, so I think that, that the small meal is just an opportunity all these extra meals to overeat. Now, if we were doing this in a hospital and we were doing a clinical trial, and this is, I think, where this idea comes from, uh, you, know, you give exa the exact food, so you, you know you spread it in, in from three to five or six, and it works, right? But then in the real world, it's just like, uh, it's very difficult for people to realize that that bagel has 400 calories and not 200 calories as you talk, right? And uh, uh, so, yeah, so that's... Uh, that's, I, I, I think those are, are important considerations. Yeah, getting kind of down to people's lives and how food fits in and how it adds in with meal times and sleep and all of these other things that we all fit in along the day is really important. Um, we're getting yeah, and, really- and, oh, and I think you know, one extra thing that I wanted to say, you know, in talking to lots of government people, both in the United States and in Italy, um, I, I be, I've been saying, you know, we're, we're all saying all these things, right? But um, can you, and I say, can you imagine if we were telling, we need to have education in the United States or in Europe, but we don't have schools and we don't have teachers, right? Or we don't provide them. Uh, you have to pay for it. Uh, so so I think, you know, lifestyle and, and nutrition particularly, but lifestyle in general, we need the schools and we need the teachers, Right. And we need this to be provided to people. And, 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 and until we do that, it's just ideas, right? We, we're, we're spreading it. And, and as the Dean said, you know, people are gonna go out and gonna hear the opposite of what we just say today. And, uh, um, and they're gonna get confused and they're not gonna do any of it. And they're gonna be part of the 72% of people that are overweight and obese. And, and the, you know, now the average American at age 50 is gonna take two or more drugs uh, so 50% of, 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 of American age 50, two or more chronic diseases or conditions and drugs. So that's a reality. And um, I think until we have the, the schools of, of lifestyle and the teachers of lifestyle and those come included in the, in the package, um, that we're going to have a problem. 
Yeah, yeah. And that brings me to these wonderful reader write watcher questions who have written into the, the chat function. I'd love to run through some of these. Um, I will use my speaker's prerogative to selfishly choose the first one, which is about the protein thing for our children. So someone wrote in, I am the parent of two young children and also feel the constant urge to push protein on them at every meal. Please provide more information about what I should emphasize instead. Um, so when I'm standing with a spoon of peanut butter, what should I be doing? That's yeah, not first that. of all, you know, get a good pediatrician that knows about nutrition, right? So, I mean, it might take a while to get one, but uh, yeah. And and the, uh, and then I think the, the, the recommendation in general about one gram per kilogram of body weight per day. So, so you know, per kilogram, not pound, right? So, yeah. So then that's the recommendation. And and we went through many, many pediatricians and experts uh, and, the, and all the literature agreed with that in most phases. Now, uh, you know, it's always good to check with the pediatrician. Is there a reason why the, 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 the child needs uh, more or less? Uh, but I think in general, uh, uh, find a, a, some pediatrician that knows what they're doing as far as nutrition is concerned. And then uh, one gram per kilogram. So it's about 0 0.45 grams uh, uh, per pound or, or so of body weight, right? So somebody... Um, weighs uh, uh you know 30 pounds that'd be about um uh, 15 grams uh, i mean yeah so let's say 20 kilograms would be about 20 grams of protein uh per day right so that's that's a recommend a recommendation and that's the other issue right often the the child is fed like an adult right so you have an adult portion and the child is 20 kilograms but it still gets an adult portion right and that's probably how we got to um, how Italy got to this three or four fold uh, uh, excess proteins. Yeah, yeah. And so turning a little bit to not the foods we eat, but things we could add on, um, if either of you would like to weigh in on this, someone wrote in, what are your thoughts on supplements? Um, they mentioned creatine, rapamycin, metformin, and then even those new diabetes drugs, those Zempic that have started bubbling up in, in news articles and um the consciousness are there things that we ought to avoid or add that are not food but supplements i think walter with his clinic would be a good person to add that and then i'd, I'd like to get back to later about the parent or the two young children yeah uh, yeah so rapamycin and metformin first of all are drugs fda approved drugs and um, and so I would be very careful. Uh, I have to say, near Barzilai and others are trying to organize a large, large trial on metformin as an anti-aging drug. And uh, but they haven't. I don't think they have started with that trial. And and the uh, and the the idea was based on the fact that people diabetics that were taking metformin were living longer than non-diabetic and they're not taking metformin. You know, and I'm not an expert on metformin, but I'm saying it was some interesting data, and and uh, and I think that uh, that's promising. But uh, I don't think people should start taking metformin uh, because of that until those those studies are are completed. Um, then as far as other supplements, most supplements have failed the, the clinical uh, testing, you know, they, they failed to show improvements in randomized clinical trials. Uh, so I, I've been recommending in my book uh, to, to take maybe a multivitamin every three or four days and my reasoning and maybe like omega-3 fish oil uh, and possibly vitamin D every three or four days. My reasoning was if somebody had a deficiency uh, this may be a good way to uh, to not exacerbate that deficiency, rather than trying to use any of these to to you know live longer or, or live healthier. Since the data is really not out there uh, for for these supplements, and uh, you know everything else, I think that I, I see the body as this beautiful um, or orchestra and, and symphony, right? And um, and and I think that when you have excess of anything you're disrupting this, this equilibrium. Right? Now, I mean, the exceptions to me uh, are the master regulator. So rapamycin may be in the category of master regulator, but it's like, I think it's an early version of what eventually, maybe 20 years down the road, could be an anti-aging drug. Why? Well, rapamycin, for example, causes uh, hyperglycemia. And so, um, and so, yeah, right, right away, even though it makes mouse, mice live longer, 
uh, it makes mice get hyperglycemia and it gets it makes people develop hyperglycemia. So it's already a bad start. So, but eventually, you know, it, because this may go after master regulator pathways, meaning like the genes that controls many genes uh, affecting aging, right? So, so then, yeah, there's certainly the possibility that what we're seeing in mice. Um, it will eventually be uh, translated into human drugs, but this is going to be probably FDA drugs and, and not supplements. And uh, so I would say probably stay away from uh, most supplements, but a few things out there are probably uh, acceptable. Yeah. So tread cautiously. Um, Marianne, if we could just in the last few minutes, jump back to you on the parent with the two kids and the, the protein. I'm, I'm going to address this from uh both having gone through this myself with my daughter, <laughs> my grandchildren, as well as being a clinical psychologist and seeing how this works with children. So um, a constant urge to push protein, uh, just a couple of recommendations. If you tell a child that you're gonna try something different, they won't do it. Okay, so one thing is, one strategy is putting a, a two that, that I can suggest. One is uh, putting out something that you want them to eat, but it's in a form that it looks similar to something they already like. So for example, you have a child who loves, absolutely loves hamburgers, but I want them to eat fish. So I make the burgers and, I, and they, they're, they're made out of fish. I don't tell him what it is and he just eats it. He likes eggs, but he doesn't like vegetables. So I poke in a little, pieces of spinach a little bit at a time, don't tell him what it is, and he eats it. And so, you know, this is approximating a change over to something that a child might find palatable without saying this is a sudden change or this is this. So just a couple of recommendations. There was, um, there was also a question about getting back to drinks um, is, how much carbonated water a week harms the calcium in your teeth is one can a day okay? I would say that's a that's fine. You know, we're talking about people who drink six, seven, eight, nine, ten cans of carbonated water or soda a day, and they're not drinking any flat water or natural water. Unflavored drinks are typically better than flavored because of the uh, lack relative lack of chemicals. And there's a question about kombucha in there, which is very popular right now. And I, I don't know of any definitive tests on that. I can say that kombucha, like kimchi, for example, like the fads that have gone on about taking a teaspoon up to a tablespoon of cider vinegar in water in the morning when you first ingest it. Um, they're all getting at things like fermentation, especially the kombucha and kimchi which if you need a rebalance of probiotics, for example, this might be helpful. The amount of kombucha or how often I can't comment on. Um, and then there was a yeah. question about is it, it seems like better. If I could just jump in to kind of sum up, it seems like there are so many open questions about all the specifics, you know, in the, the practical day-to-day -day living that people have. Um, we could talk for hours. Unfortunately, our time is up. Um, I just want to thank you both, Walter and Marianne. This was a real pleasure, and we learned a lot. I hope um, this answered some questions for people, and we'll stay tuned to your research and, and keep learning. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.